The subcommittee will come to order, and good morning to everyone. Today we will examine the state of competition for video programming. In 1992, Congress recognized that the cable industry, which then dominated the market for the delivery of multi-channel video programming, could use its control over that programming in order to stifle competition. In order to enable competition in multi-channel video delivery, Congress enacted program access requirements in 1992 to prevent cable operators with ownership interests in video programming from refusing to sell their programs to the emerging satellite providers. That requirement is broadly acknowledged as being essential to the birth of the DBS industry and the competition to cable that direct broadcast satellite has brought. Congress also, uh, in 1992, enacted program carriage requirements that prevent cable operators from discriminating against unaffiliated programming in favor of their affiliated networks. The rules have been broadly successful. Without them, neither satellite television nor multi-channel video delivered by telephone companies such as Verizon's Fios service or AT&T's Uverse service could have entered the market. The rules have also been instrumental to the success of independent cable networks like the Food Network and Bravo. But at the time that the program access provision was approved by Congress in 1992, it applied only to programs that were delivered by satellite to multi-channel video dis distributors. Today, what is commonly known as the terrestrial loophole has arisen as vertically integrated cable operators use fiber optics more and more frequently in order to deliver some of their programming to cable head ends. Fiber-based terrestrial networks have become economical alternatives to satellite delivery, particularly for regional sports and for news programming controlled by regionally clustered cable operators. Cable operators which deliver programming terrestrially can block competing multi-channel providers' access to their highly popular program offerings. These arrangements are understandably troubling for some sports fans who may have to choose between subscribing to the video programming provider of their choice uh, or accessing the games of their favorite regional sports teams. Uh, in 2007, the Federal Communications Commission found that subscribership to direct broadcast satellite was 40 percent below what otherwise would be expected in Philadelphia, where a cable operator's regional sports network has a lock on the Phillies, the Flyers, and 76ers games. In San Diego, the Commission determined that lack of access to the regional sports network provided by the uh, programming by, by the uh, Padres games resulted in a 33 percent reduction in the households subscribing to direct broadcast satellite in the San Diego area. The problem of the unavailability of terrestrially delivered programming on DBS systems is even worse for some rural residents for whom switching to cable service may not even be an option because a cable operator may not serve the area in which the rural resident lives. If direct broadcast satellite companies and phone companies are precluded from carrying regional sports programming, it effectively bars many rural fans from viewing their favorite teams. We're interested in hearing from today's witnesses about the terrestrial loophole as it currently exists and the consequences of it. What benefits does continued uh, use of the terrestrial loophole offer to the providers of multi-channel video and to consumers, and what are its harms? And we have knowledgeable witnesses who will speak to us on that subject from a range of different perspectives this morning. We're also interested in other matters. The FCC has recently considered a number of program carriage complaints by independent programmers that a multi-channel video programming distributor favored its own programming over the unaffiliated programming with respect to the terms and conditions of carriage. Does the FCC's program carriage complaint process work as Congress intended, or should we consider modifications? 
Finally, an increasing amount of video content is now available by means of the Internet. Some programming web use generated, such as uh, uh, YouTube, uh, is, uh, is user generated and available uh, without regard uh, to the identity of the originating entity and its vertically integrated nature. Other inter internet based services like Hulu and the websites of the major television networks offer full episodes of programming that aired on television as recently as the previous day. The more such programming migrates to the Internet, the less consumers may need to subscribe to a multi-channel video programming distributor at all. At the same time, some websites that offer video content, such as ESPN 360, are only available to subscribers of particular multi-channel video programming distributors. What are the implications of these emerging business models for consumers and for competition in video distribution? I expect that our knowledgeable witnesses today will offer a thoughtful analysis of these and other matters regarding video distribution in uh, this digital era. And we thank them for their presence here and look forward very much to their testimony. Uh, that concludes my remarks, and I'm pleased to recognize the gentleman from Florida, uh, the ranking Republican member of the subcommittee, Mr. Stearns. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this uh, very interesting hearing. Um, the issues surrounding video competition obviously are very important. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and thank them for taking their time to be here. Uh, competition in the video marketplace has been robust. Uh, Twenty years ago, cable commanded almost 100 percent of the multi-channel television market. Today, because of fierce competition, uh, cable's market share has dropped uh, to about 63 percent of multi-channel video households. As we know, uh, consumers can choose from a variety of multi-channel video providers, including direct broadcast satellite. In fact, as of June 2009, DirecTV, with 18.3 million subscribers, was larger than all the cable companies in the United States except Comcast. EchoStar, with almost 14 million subscribers, was the third largest multi-channel video provider in the United States. Competition from the phone companies, such as Verizon and AT&T, and websites offering everything from home videos to full-length movies, have brought even more choice to the consumers. As a result of this competition, 37.8 million consumers, over one of every three video subscribers, can now obtain multi-channel video programming from some company other than their local cable operator. It is a truly amazing thing how far we have come in such a short amount of time. Even the FCC has acknowledged the competition in the video market. The FCC's 2009 annual report on video competition reinforced the trend line of previous reports, confirming growth and entrenchment of competition in the video marketplace, the decline of vertical integration between cable operators and program networks, and the emergence of a new video competition from programming that's distributed on the Internet. Innovations and new products are still being created all the time. The next frontier is Internet-based video, which now competes with cable, satellite, and telebo telephone providers, giving consumers even more choice. Applications such as Hula, uh, which the chairman mentioned, which provides longer network television programs, continue to experience explosive growth with 373 million video streams per month. Overall, online video usage has grown almost 25 percent to an average of 9.5 billion streams a month. Yet, despite all this competition, we still operate under regular, regulatory regimes stemming from the radio broadcast provisions of the 1934 Communications Act and the multi-channel video programming distributor provisions of the 1992 Cable and 1996 Telecommunications Act. And as much as we are finding in the broadband context, regulatory policies can hinder, rather than help, investment and the rollout of video services to consumers when competing platforms are present in the market. The growth in digital video programming is requiring significant investment in the Internet and beyond. Cable and satellite providers and now telephone companies are making large investments in equipment 
and capacity to accommodate next generation video content. Broadcasters and other programmers are incurring large costs to create and transmit digital programming. In a competitive environment, network neutrality mandates and regulations in general deter investments, at least put a chill on them. Any discrimination and openness mandates limit companies' ability to differentiate themselves from the competitors and provide their customers with the unique products and the high level of service they demand. As a video industry competes in a digital world where the winning business models are not clear yet, it becomes even more important to rely on market forces and not on regulation. In such a competitive environment and absent any evidence that consumers are being harmed, it makes little sense to create a new regulatory environment that would only freeze investment and stunt innovation. When Congress adopted the program access rules in the 1992 Cable Act, Congress wanted to ensure that the infant satellite television industry and other independent pay television providers simply had access to content. Thus, Section 628 prohibits a cable operator from unfairly hindering the ability of other pay television providers to gain access to programming in which the cable operator has an ownership interest. Congress did, however, include an exception for terrestrial delivered programming as opposed to programming delivered to providers using a satellite network. Congress wanted to give providers an incentive to invest in local programming. That incentive would be diminished if providers were forced to share the content they develop with their competitors, especially since they would need to spread their cost over less than a national audience. Moreover, when providers launch unique offerings to differentiate themselves from their competitors, consumers benefit from a greater selection and a quality of programming. As I've said, the video market is very competitive, and at this point, consumers have many choices. So I look forward to this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate, again, the witnesses uh, coming here to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. We are in the midst of one of the most profound technological revolutions since the invention of the wireless. It heralds great abundance in the generation and delivery of content, which is all to the good. We need to ensure, however, that we have an architecture of policy and technology that ensures diversity, competition, choice, and access. As always, the interests to be served first are those of viewers and users, the interests of competition and not any specific competitor. This hearing will help frame these issues. I especially want to recognize and welcome uh, Ronald Moore, who is testifying on behalf of the Writers Guild of America West. Mr. Moore is an, is an Emmy Award-winning writer and producer of some of the most popular science fiction programs in history, and I welcome your participation today. And I look forward to hearing your insights on the consolidation of program ownership. It's very important that those who create video programming are not left out of this debate. The market for the distribution of video programming is changing. Many consumers have the option to subscribe to at least two pay television services delivered via cable, satellite, or fiber optic line. In addition, the transition to digital over-the-air broadcasts has given traditional broadcasters the opportunity to deploy more channels with new and innovative programming. Meanwhile, more and more consumers are relying on their broadband connections to access web-based video services. And these new web-based distribution models offer great hope for many in the creative community. As I have indicated, all of these changes are creating both opportunities and challenges. For example, program carriage and program access issues remain, particularly when a distributor owns programming that is comparable to or competes with independently owned programming. In this case, it may be difficult for competitors to field the types of products and services that consumers want. As with other areas of te telecommunications, policy, the advantages of historic incumbency can be difficult for new entrants to overcome absent government intervention, and I'm pleased that even 
the nation's largest telecommunications companies recognize this, recognize this fact. I look forward to reviewing all of our witnesses' testimony. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Chairman Waxman. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized for two minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and with all due respect, uh, I don't think that this is necessarily the appropriate hearing that we ought to be having today. Uh, we should be putting closer scrutiny on the proposals pending before the FCC and why these proposed regulations carve out certain companies and how regulation may stifle much-needed private investment. We are entering a new digital age and a new age of entertainment, and more than ever, the consumer is king. Consumers don't want their entertainment options dictated to them. They want greater control over not only what they watch, but also where and when they watch it. And these new consumer expectations will continue to fuel investment, innovation, and competition. But let's not forget, without investment in the physical network, there won't be much room for innovation or competition. It is my view that public policy must focus on enabling network operators to secure and utilize the investment capital to meet that demand and to build out the vast network necessary to allow for the deployment of new services, while still ensuring that services remain affordable for all consumers. And I've stated in the past, proposed network neutrality rules seek to alleviate a problem that doesn't exist and threatens to deter the investment necessary to enable consumers to enjoy additional exciting new features in the Internet uh, that the Internet could offer. Unnecessary new regs, such as those proposed by the FCC chair, will stifle future broadband investment and have broad economic implications. How does the FCC think that the U.S. will achieve ubiquitous broadband deployment after the agency imposes onerous regulations that will drive investment out of the broadband sector? The U.S. desperately needs broadband investment to help lift the nation out of economic malaise, and the FCC must not undermine that investment. Both the Post and Wall Street Journal editorial pages agree that the chairman's proposal would harm broadband investment. The Post concluded that the FCC's proposal would, quote, stifle further investments by ISPs with attempts to micromanage what has been a vibrant and well-functioning marketplace. And the journal concluded that threatening to limit, uh, to limit what telco companies can charge and who, to whom net neutrality rules would discourage broadband investments. Uh, this yesterday's Reuters uh, uh, report, uh, and I quote here, says, Verizon Communications Inc. Chief uh, Ivan Seidenberg said that debate around the proposal is extremely troubling and could halt progress in U.S. broadband investment. Uh, from 01 to 08, communication systems uh, invested tens of billions of dollars. The bottom line is this, in conclusion, that without a regulatory touch, Video has flourished in content and volume for all consumers. The same can happen with Internet access. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingell, Chairman Emeritus of the Full Committee, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I commend you for your initiative in overseeing the state of competition in video programming. I would note with no mean degree of dissatisfaction that the committee's understanding of this important issue would have been much better informed and much more solidly based had the Federal Communications Commission, under the chairmanship of former Chairman Kevin Martin, not abdicated its duty to complete annual studies on video programming competition. I want to commend Chairman Genovsky for acting to correct this disregard of responsibility and in particular extend my thanks and appreciation to Commissioner Copps, who is acting chairman of the commission first set out to deal with this matter. Since passage of the Cable Act in 1992, the market for video programming has changed significantly. While 20 years ago, a majority of the subscribers received video content from cable providers, they now enjoy a, a greater choice as evidenced by the robust participation of fiber optic and satellite providers in the marketplace. As the committee once again takes up this matter, it is my hope that our witnesses will provide us with a sense of how competition in the video programming market has evolved and what issues remain to be addressed, including their candid suggestions for how to do so. 
In closing, it remains my desire to ensure that all people, regardless of income, are able to view free, over-the-air television with local programming. This belief will inform my participation in the debate we once again begin today. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy and for your foresight. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Chairman Dingell. The um, gentle lady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will submit my full statement. I know we're anxious to get to the hearing, and I do have questions for some of you, believe it or not. Uh, as you all can imagine, video competition is something important to me and my constituents in Tennessee. We have a lot of content producers there, and they are certainly watching what is happening. So welcome to all of you who are our witnesses today. Mr. Chairman, I will tell you that it is always of concern to me when I see government insert itself into a private sector issue where there is no compelling reason to do so. And I think that's what we find ourselves facing right now. We know that increased regulation is going to give you less of what you want. And what people want to see is good, solid, aggressive competition in this marketplace. They want to see it spur innovation. They want to see it spur investment. They want to see it spur job creation. And I think Congress mandating how these companies are going to market their products and services will end up being counterproductive. Now, uh, there are some things I do hope we talk a little bit more about. Mr. Moore, I'm going to want to talk with you a little bit about the uh, 92 Cable Act. I know that you reference in your testimony what has happened to production over the past 10 years. And sometimes that strong hand of Congress or government inserting itself can be counterproductive. So I look forward uh, to visiting with you. Mr. Knorr, I'm going to want to talk with you about what we see happening to small businesses and those that are entrepreneurial and innovative as we look at the expansion of broadband and the opportunity to expand access to the content that our creative community does, uh, does put out there for everyone. I know that Mr. Pine, you're going to have a little bit to say about having consumers access that. So welcome to you all. We look forward to the hearing. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Blackburn. The um, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, for holding today's hearing on the status of video competition in a digital age. Last year, we held a similar hearing on competition in the sports programming market. At that time, I voiced my concerns that the NFL network was removed from the basic tier by Comcast and moved to a more expensive sports tier. Hoping to resolve the issue after it appeared to have hit a stalemate and all options were explored, I wrote to the FCC and requested that an arbitrator be appointed to serve as an independent third party. However, the FCC did not have to weigh in to end the dispute and the parties negotiate a mutually beneficial private agreement. I want to express my appreciation to Comcast for working with the NFL Network to ensure that sports fans were not denied access to content they demand. In the end, the dispute serves as an example of how these issues can be resolved to the benefit of consumers without direct government intervention. Today we will hear from our witnesses on challenges they have encountered in providing content to their consumers while as, as well as their suggested solutions to the problem. We should tread carefully when discussing legislative fixes when private solutions have not been exhausted. That is not to say that we should not act to ensure fair competition in the video marketplace. It is only to say that we should act as a last resort. Ultimately, we have a responsibility to ensure that consumers have access to the content they pay for and that the market power is not abused to their detriment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing. I look forward to discussing with our witnesses how we can ensure that there, we have fair competition in the video marketplace. Thank you very much, Mr. Stupak. The gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Terry, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my opening statement would be simply repetitive of Mr. Upton's opening statement, so I'll say I'll associate myself with his remarks, and thank you all for being here and yield back. 
Thank you very much. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just want to welcome the witnesses, and I'll waive opening statement for time on questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman from Connecticut, uh, Mr. Murphy, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for uh, today's hearing. Uh, having uh, looked at the testimony uh, to, to be presented today, I know uh, that our hearing is going to be especially relevant to parts of my district in southwestern Connecticut. Much of our witness testimony deals with the issue of competition in the New York metropolitan market between competitors uh, that are also present there uh, and are undergoing the same competition uh, in my district and the district of my colleague, uh, Mr. Heim. So I'm interested to hear specifically about uh, some of the issues relevant to that uh, market. I also look forward to hearing from our witnesses today to get a better understanding of how current market dynamics uh, and what, if anything, this Congress needs to do to ensure that our constituents have opportunities to receive the programming they desire at a fair price while ensuring that we don't stifle the development of innovative and new programming. I'm especially interested to the extent that this hearing treads into the emerging new technologies which allow our constituents to receive programming online. Um, a part of this hearing may focus on some of the emerging technologies like Hulu and Zillion TV, which I think have some uh, very interesting and potentially transformative impacts on our constituents. Um, but this Congress needs to be mindful while we want to set um, a foundation that allows for that innovation to be very careful about uh, not allowing for the type of Internet piracy um, and copyright violation that has hampered uh, many of our efforts uh, to try to promote the expansion of new and unique programming uh, into the online space. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for the hearing and look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Murphy. The uh, gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Deal, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we all understand that we are in an evolutionary change in media and that evolutionary change has, of course, informed us better and we're better connected. But the growth has uh, come in the emergence of trying to protect the rights of copyright owners, compensating those who own the signals and on which the copyrighted program will travel, and meeting the demand of consumers who want unfettered access to programming. Uh, certainly the video marketplace is more competitive than ever. I think the questions we have to answer is how can we make this market marketplace completely free so that everyone from the programming owner to the programming provider to the programming, programming consumer will be benefited. Last week, this committee uh, dealt with uh, the Satellite Home Viewers Reauthorization Act. At that time, the committee adopted an amendment that was passed requiring the DISH Network to carry the public broadcasting service in high definition sooner than the parties involved were able to reach an agreement. Under the intention of providing public airwaves to all consumers, the government forced a satellite carrier to carry a station without permitting DISH to choose whether or not they wanted to carry it. This illustrates the problem with retransmission consent as broadcasters are able to use their government-given marketplace leverage to force carriage of their programming on the distributor in unbalanced negotiations. The practice of retransmission consent is nothing but a government-regulated monopoly as Congress has given authority to broadcasters to negotiate on their terms. It is my hope that this witness panel will be able to discuss a solution to the problems of retransmission consent in an honest and fair manner. In the end, it is the consumer that drives competition. Competition fosters innovation, and innovation is what we thrive for for the future. Today, I hope we'll be able to work towards solutions that help promote a free and fair market, one in which broadcasters, distributors, and consumers are afforded flexibility, transparency, and more importantly, choice. Yield back my time. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today we examine video competition in a digital age, a topic with relevance to all Americans who watch TV. That's a lot of Americans. Uh, the status of competition in the video market affects all of those viewers, whether they're actively aware of it or not. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my, uh, in my district, my caseworkers, and by the way, I have a very rural district, very much like your own, uh, we receive a steady stream of phone calls from uh, my constituents complaining that they cannot get the video services they desire. The cable company doesn't come out far enough to reach their homes, which are some distance back from the main thoroughfares. Two of the five DMAs covering Ohio's 18th Congressional District have only one of the two major satellite providers offering service, uh, not to mention that one of the markets lacks local into local programming. Uh, and I've spoken repeatedly about the lack of broadband access in uh, the Appalachian terrain of southeastern Ohio, uh, a sad state of affairs that continues to limit content availability on countless fronts. 
so I think my constituents might disagree with some of the testimony that's uh, going to be offered today uh, that competition is alive and well. Uh, while that certainly may be the case in more urban and suburban areas of our country, uh, my constituents generally have just one choice for pay television services from a multi-channel video programming distributor. And one choice isn't really any choice at all. Uh, I worry that once again rural America is being left behind. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing and certainly for your tireless devotion to meeting the needs of rural America. And I look forward and, uh, to the testimony of our witnesses and thank them for their appearance. Thank you very much, Mr. Space. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the only thing I really want to say is that uh, I understand clearly how important uh, legislation and regulation is going to be in terms of enhancing the competitiveness of, of video broadcasting. Uh, the wrong ideas are going to make uh, the, the market a lot less competitive uh, and select winners rather than let the market select the winners. So uh, I'm looking forward to what your testimony is and to learn as much as we can before we actually start uh, marking up uh, ideas on the paper. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Space. The gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, very much for uh, calling this uh, hearing. It's an exciting new world, and uh, I'm very interested in your opinions, your expert advice on where we, uh, where we should be uh, going forward. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and I'll yield back. Thank you, Ms. Castor. Uh, the uh, gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welsh, just joined us and, and is going to waive his statement. And both Ms. Castor uh, and Mr. Welsh, as well as Mr. McNearney, will have two minutes added to their question time for witnesses, um, as, as, as will Mr. Doyle. Uh, our other members seeking recognition. Uh, that concludes opening statements. And we welcome now our panel of witnesses and express thanks to each of you for taking part in our hearing this morning. I'll say a brief word of introduction about uh, each of our witnesses. Mr. Thomas Rutledge is the Chief Operating Officer of Cablevision Systems Corporation, one of the nation's major cable companies. Mr. Benjamin Pine is President of Global Distributions for Disney Media Networks. Mr. Patrick Kaur is the Chief Operating Officer of Sunflower Broadband. Mr. Ronald Moore is a writer and executive producer testifying on behalf of the Writers Guild of America West, previously introduced by Chairman Waxman. Mr. Terrence Denson is Vice President of Corporate Marketing for Verizon. And Mr. Adam Thayer is President of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. We welcome each of you and without objection to your prepared written statement will be made a part of our record. We would welcome your oral summaries of your testimony and ask that you try to keep those oral summaries to approximately five minutes. That way we'll have ample time for questions. And we'll proceed from the left and proceed to the right. That's not a philosophical comment, but it does coincide with philosophical positioning, at least uh, for the last witness uh, to some extent. Uh, Mr. Rutledge, we'll be pleased to begin with you. And if you could pull that microphone a bit closer and be sure that it's on, we can hear you better. Good morning. That's better. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Tom Rutledge, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Cablevision Systems Corporation. I also serve as Chairman of the Board of Directors of the National Cable Television Association. Mr. Chairman, the state of video competition is very healthy, especially in Cablevision's area, the most competitive market in the country. We face competitors many times our size by any metric, and consumers have been the primary beneficiaries of this competition. After the 1996 Act, Cablevision invested more than $5 billion to build the most advanced communications network in the country. Cablevision offers, offers all, not some, but every household in our service area an array of new digital video voice and high-speed internet services at significant savings to what our customers used to pay our competitors. As the Congress recognizes, competition breeds innovation and investment. In competitive markets like New York, the, the rules 
designed to jumpstart competition where there was less multi-channel video competition 17 years ago. The program access rules are no longer appropriate. Attempts to use the regulatory framework for competitive advantage, such as by expanding the satellite delivered program access rules, should be dismissed out of hand. Companies should continue to have incentives to compete in the marketplace, not in the regulatory arena. For years, Cablevision has faced vigorous competition from DISH and DirecTV, currently the second and third largest video distributor distributors, and Verizon and AT&T, the nation's largest telecommunications companies, and currently the eighth and tenth largest video distributors. These phone companies are significantly larger than Cablevision, more than ten times our size. Cablevision has always competed by investing and innovating to create products that meaningfully differentiate our service. Cablevision was the first cable company to launch digital video service throughout its footprint, including high-definition offerings free of charge with our customers' packages. We launched the nation's fastest internet service, Optimum Online Ultra, and are now building the country's largest Wi-Fi network to provide our customers free access to the internet service and public spaces in our marketplace. Similar groundbreaking investments have been made with regard to content to ensure that Cablevision continues to provide unique value for customers. Examples include News 12. In 1986, Cablevision launched News 12, the nation's first 24-hour hyper-local news channel, and now offers seven individual lo local news channels and five traffic and weather channels. Madison Square Garden, high definition. In 1998, Cablevision became the nation's first regular provider of sports coverage in high definition. Cablevision's investment was a gamble. It required a sizable investment at a time when very few people had high definition televisions. Recently, Cablevision launched Madison Square Garden Varsity, a new multi-platform suite of television and interactive services dedicated to local high school sports, academics, and activities of interest to our local communities. Our investments and local and regional program, programming have been both risky and substantial. The program access rule adopted in 1992 to ensure that new competitors like DirecTV and DISH could launch with key programming is now at odds with this kind of innovation. In fact, Congress recognized this potential negative impact and allowed for a periodic review and sunset of the program access rules. The implication of keeping these rules in effect is clear. If you take a risk to develop creative and often costly new programming and you fail, you alone bear that cost. But if you succeed, you must share the fruits of your risk and innovation with your competitors. To jumpstart competition in the multi-channel video distribution market in 1992, Congress required that all satellite-delivered cable programming be given to new satellite competitors. However, Congress also wisely established a new opportunity for innovation and in programming where a cable operator could create new programming, deliver it terrestrially, and not be forced to share it with its competitors. To reverse this policy would undermine competition by discouraging the, that investment in new content and services. If a company is facing vigorous competition, why would that company invest in untested and expensive services if it had to share those services with its competitors? In the interest of investment, innovation, and competition, we strongly urge that efforts to expand the program access regulations be rejected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Mr. Pine. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Ben Pine, and I am President of Global Distribution, Disney Media Networks. I truly appreciate the invitation to talk with you today about video competition. There has never been a more competitive video marketplace, never. Thanks to Congress and the FCC, consumers today have more choices and more video content available to them than at any time in history. Most consumers now have the choice of three, four, or more competitive options to receive multi-channel video. While cable once was feared to be a monopoly, today 36 million customers subscribe to non-cable MVPDs. On the programming side, Competition for eyeballs has never been more fierce. Over the last 30 years, the number of programming services literally has exploded. According to the FCC, there are now approximately 565 national satellite-delivered cable programming networks. And cable and satellite's most popular services now reach nearly 100 million households. At the same time, vertical integration among programmers has decreased. 
Of course, the exponential expansion of content on the Internet, whether video streams or social networking, has created even more competition. Today, subscribers to multi-channel video get great value for their money. For about $50 per month, subscribers get thousands of hours of entertainment, news, sports, documentaries, lifestyle, children's and family-friendly programming. In fact, with all the great content on multi-channel television, consumers spend much more per hour on movies, home video, mobile phones, print media, and video games than for cable television. Disney realizes that as a result of all the competition that Congress has helped unleash, some cable operators are facing competitive pressure from satellite telco and other new video entrants. In an effort to provide some relief to the smallest cable operators most impacted by this increase in competition, Disney and ABC have granted many small cable operators free retransmission consent for the current three-year cycle for the 10 ABC stations owned by Disney. Specifically, Disney granted free retransmission consent to 90 small cable operators out of a total of 113 operators with whom we deal in our markets. With respect to our non-broadcast channels, Disney and ESPN have deals with the NCTC, the small cable operator cooperative, for all of our cable channels. This provides NCTC members with buying power equal to the nation's fifth largest multi-channel video provider. Given these and similar efforts, the subcommittee should not get involved in the private negotiations between programmers and distributors. Technology has empowered the consumer more than ever before, and at our company, we create and use technology to deliver content to reach our fans and viewers. In doing so, Disney has been a pioneer. Through video downloads on iTunes, video streaming on ABC.com, video on Hulu, video over broadband on ESPN360.com, video on demand, video on mobile devices, and our production of high-definition video video across content, uh, content across broadcast cable, satellite, and of course DVD. These are just some examples of ways we have de developed to serve c consumers in this new age of, of media technology, and we always will continue to find new ways to get our content to our consumers. Turning to broadband, Disney and ESPN distribute content on the internet through various models. ESPN360.com is our sports event broadband product and it features an online video player and access to a broad array of game telecasts and long-form sports content. ESPN360.com is available to any and all ISPs for a fee. It is currently available to over 50 million households representing approximately two-thirds of broadband subscribers in the United States. It provides fans with access to more than 3,500 live, full-game telecasts every year, many of which would not otherwise be available in any other domestic outlet. outlet. Nobody in the marketplace is currently delivering this volume of multi-sport coverage online. I want to be clear on one point, though. Contrary to what you may hear, ESPN360.com has nothing to do with net neutrality. The entire debate over net neutrality involves network management issues and the relationship of an ISP to its subscribers. In contrast, the business model of ESPN360 has nothing to do with the actions taken by any ISP, such as network management or retail pricing. Now and in the future, getting the balance right between convenience and pricing is a challenge facing all of us who create and distribute digital content. Adding to that challenge is the problem of piracy. We believe the best place to start to fight piracy is to bring content to market on a well-timed and well-priced basis. Disney is working to do just that. However, piracy is a growing threat to our ability to deliver great content. We are all looking to increase broadband deployment and adoption and we at Disney believe that it will be high quality sports and entertainment video that will help drive that adoption. But unless that content is protected as it flows over broadband, it will be pirated and ultimately our ability to produce that very content will be undermined. We believe that ISP should be encouraged to use the most effective and commercially reasonable technologies and processes to help curb the tidal wave of stolen content present on their networks today. In closing, thanks to Congress's pro-competitive policies, video competition is thriving. In our view, no additional government regulation of this dynamic and competitive marketplace is necessary or appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Kaur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. The American Cable Association represents nearly 1,000 independent cable operators that primarily invest in small and rural communities where the big guys find it unattractive to provide service. Our members don't own or control national or major regional programming. 
Access to video content is tightly controlled by large media companies that have built their business models on top of decades-old regulation. As a result, our costs for this content have grown exponentially over the past few years, and this is why your cable bill goes up every year. As an entrepreneur from Kansas, there is one message I hope you take away from my testimony. Do not believe those that say the sky will fall if you seek to improve the market for consumers by changing the status quo. I'd like to remind you that Congress changed the cable laws in 1992 because it thought the marketplace could be better for consumers. In 1996, you updated communications law because you thought consumers could get better, more innovative service. And you did it with the Satellite Home Viewer Act and most recently with the DTV transition. Embracing change needs to be your philosophy once again. For instance, Congress needs to confront federal rules that grant broadcasters exclusivity and insulate them from competition. A recent study shows that retransmission consent fees will increase from $500 million in 2008 to $1.2 billion by 2011. And a disproportionate amount of this revenue will come from consumers served by small and rural cable operators. To be clear, what happens today is not a negotiation for most ACA members, a retransmission consent negotiation is a take-it-or-leave-it deal between an operator and a government-sanctioned monopoly. Networks use affiliation agreements to extend and ensure this monopoly status across every corner of a DMA. This artificially raises the price and keeps consumers from receiving relevant programming like sports and weather from neighboring markets. Video providers should have the option to offer consumers the most relevant and affordable broad broadcast content available. This is best accomplished by giving video providers the option of bringing in broadcast signals from adjacent markets. Today, robust competition exists. In some rural markets, satellite has become the dominant provider. In the area of retransmission consent, DBS providers have the option to place broadcasters on a separate tier as an optional purchase. This gives DBS both a negotiating and pricing advantage over small cable operators who cannot offer this option to their price-conscious consumers. Therefore, small cable operators must have parity with satellite to remain competitive. They must have the same option to tier broadcasters. Moreover, smaller operators and their consumers pay significantly higher programming rates not only for retransmission consent broadcast channels, but also cable and sports programming just because they are small businesses with minimal market power to negotiate fair terms from dominant media providers. There's an additional extremely important issue for you to consider regarding how programming is being delivered via the Internet. ESPN is pioneering a closed Internet business model with its ESPN 360 offering, where broadband service providers are required to pay a per subscriber fee for every consumer they serve. If a provider does not pay this fee, ESPN blocks access to ESPN 360 and does not provide any options to consumers to access that content at any price. There are multiple problems with this situation. First, a person that is out of work and needs the Internet only to apply for a job must now subsidize those who want to access ESPN 360 on a regular basis. Second, it would establish a precedent that content companies can restrict consumer choices in the exact way that net neutrality was designed to prevent ISPs from doing. Wall Street loves this kind of business model and is encouraging others to follow ESPN's lead. So this will not be a unique situation. Because ESPN embraces this model, you can expect Hulu, YouTube, and others to follow suit. How much will they charge? If this model proliferates with millions of Internet content sites, consumers will ultimately pay exponentially higher rates for broadband service at a time when Congress is working to make broadband more affordable. ACA believes that consumers should be given a choice and a chance to access any legal content on the Internet regardless of their ISP. Therefore, we would request that if you are to proceed in addressing net neutrality legislation, that you do not solely focus just on network service providers, but address content providers that intend to limit consumer choice. So what can be done to create a better video market? There are many suggestions detailed in my testimony, but I will focus on four here. First, prohibit any party, including a network, from providing a broadcast station outside of the local market area from granting retransmission consent to a smaller cable company outside of the broadcaster's protected zone. Second, provide parity with DBS that would permit small cable operators from offering local broadcast programming on its own tier as an optional purchase. Third, direct the FCC to review all programming contracts to empirically determine the level of programming price discrimination and take necessary corrective action. 
Finally, providers of content services and applications should not be allowed to block consumers' access to their products regardless of their ISP. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Corr. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Chairman Boucher, Chairman Waxman, Ranking Member Stearns, and the other esteemed members of the committee. It is an honor to testify before you today. My name is Ron Moore, and I am the executive producer and creator of Battlestar Galactica. I was also a writer-producer on the TV series Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Roswell, and Carnival, and I'm currently working on my next project, Caprica, a TV series for the Sci-Fi Network. I've been a working writer in the entertainment business for over two decades, and in that time, the television marketplace has fundamentally changed, and in my opinion, not for the better. There are actually fewer places to sell ideas, both in terms of the numbers of studios available to buy programming and the numbers of independent networks available to deliver it. While this might seem counterintuitive in an environment where the number, number of cable and satellite channels routinely runs into the hundreds, a closer look reveals that the media consolidation has resulted in the vast majority of television shows being produced by a handful of conglomerates, and the vast majority of cable channels are also owned by only a small number of companies. This environment is a direct result of the repeal of the financial interest and syndication rules in the mid-1990s. The challenge now is to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen again that the future of programming on the Internet does not fall victim to the same mistakes that led to the current domination of media conglomerates and traditional television. Let's take a moment to look at some of the raw numbers. In 1989, there were 18 production companies who were significant suppliers to the broadcast networks. In 2009, there are eight. After the repeal of the FinCEN rules, we went from a system where studios competed with each other for ideas and networks competed with each other for programming to a system where studios and networks are now combined into enormous entities who favor doing business with themselves. Let's take a look at the next chart. Sixty-six percent of the series airing on broadcast television this fall are produced by the network's own in-house studios. These studios no longer look for the best idea. They look for the idea that best helps their corporate sibling. The further consolidation of the industry, like the proposed merger of NBC with Comcast, certainly demands scrutiny and investigation into its impact on competition and diversity of programming. But what is the impact on the television audience and the American public? How does squeezing out the independent studio and eliminating autonomy for the writer-producer affect content? The answer is that fewer voices and fewer players reduces access and cre creates a more homogenized product for the audience. Before the repeal of FinCEN, an independent studio like Carsey Warner could produce a show like Roseanne which featured a working-class family dealing with the struggles and conflicts common to working families all over America. Roseanne was about a contractor and his sometimes working, sometimes unemployed wife and their efforts to keep a roof over their heads. This followed in a tradition of independent programming that spoke to the same sensibility of all in the family where Archie Bunker worked on the loading dock or the honeymooners where Ralph Cramden drove a bus and his best friend worked in the sewer. That sensibility, the voice of the broad American working class, has vanished from television. These voices, these independent voices, are missing, and they're missing because a monoculture has been allowed to be nurtured in TV where new ideas and new players face virtually impossible odds out of getting their shows on the air. So, what can be done? If this committee supports competition in video programming, there are many things you can do. First, across town today, the Federal Communications Commission is taking the first steps to codify Internet freedom. An open Internet promises to be an extremely competitive marketplace where small entrepreneurs can be matched up against the media giants of today and thrive. Supporting a free, open, and non-discriminatory Internet will allow the next generation of creators and innovators to distribute their own content and compete for the hearts and minds and eyeballs of the audience. Second, we must remember that traditional media still has by far the broadest reach into America's homes. While broadcast networks complain of declining ratings, overall television viewership is actually increasing. Cable viewership is growing steadily, and so the relationships between major cable distributors and programmers needs closer scrutiny. The practice of tying and bundling channels is one practice worthy of examination. When you learn that some of these bundled channels offer nothing more than a static weather map with national viewing levels in the tens of thousands, you realize that this is actually filler content whose only purpose is to block other programmers from gaining access to the cable satellite channels. Whether a la carte cable channel selection will eliminate those barriers is an open question, but it is certainly worthy of further analysis by the FCC and this committee. In conclusion, I would like to point out that I have worked for major studios and networks my entire career from Paramount to HBO to NBC Universal, where Caprica is being shot this very day. I have found success in the corporate structure. These companies are not evil. They are not populated by modern-day robber barons intent on stealing the bread from my children's mouths. These companies are only doing what makes sense to them financially. However, what makes financial sense to a handful of corporations may not be in the best interests of the audience, the television industry itself, or the American people. 
These companies are run by and large by good and decent people who are simply working within the regulatory environment that they have been given, and therein lies the rub. By setting up a regu regulatory environment in which there are no barriers to continual corporate consolidation and huge incentives to both centralize power and squeeze out smaller players, even good and decent people will participate in and promote a system that ends up weakening competition, monopolizing power, and corrupting the free flow of ideas and opportunities for all. The danger we face is not that we work for bad men and women. It is that good men and women can produce bad results in the absence of the law. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Denson. Good morning, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and other members of the subcommittee. My name is Terry Denson, and I am Vice President of Content and Programming for Verizon. Mr. I'm Denson, could you pull that microphone just a bit closer, please? Closer. That's, thank, thank you. Even a little closer than that would be good. Thank you. I am responsible for obtaining access to video programming to support Verizon's consumer services, including Fios TV. Verizon and its 200,000 plus employees are leading the way with investments in both wireline and wireless broadband, net broadband networks. Verizon has invested over $80 billion in capital, in capital expenditures over the last five years, more than any other American company during that time period. Verizon is investing $23 billion to take fiber all the way to customers' homes with our Fios network. This enables both video competition and next generation broadband networks and services to 18 million homes and businesses. Verizon's Fios internet access service currently provides consumers with maximum speeds of up to 50 megabits per second downstream and we are already testing 100 megabits per, per second services. Our Fios TV video service is an integral part of the business case for our Fios investment. Such services provide additional choices and competition for consumers. Fios TV brings head-to-head -head wireline video competition to the cable incumbents for the first time in several markets. Fios TV has more capacity than traditional cable providers and is able to provide consumers with a wide range of video content, including a robust lineup of HD programming, independent programming, and international and multicultural content. Fios TV is also designed to enable innovative and interactive services. For example, the IP functionality of Verizon's network permits the company to offer a unique service called Fios TV widgets that allow co consumers to access content in an interactive manner on their television, including some content and services from the internet, such as Facebook and Twitter, and other, and other compelling interactive services that serve their community, weather widgets, traffic will, widgets, and widgets that provide vital information to consumers when they want it and where they want it. While millions of, while millions of customers are already enjoying our FIO services, new entrants like Verizon's face, Verizon face a number of challenges. For the most part, Verizon is able to deal with these challenges such as rising programming through creative negotiation. One significant challenge has proven difficult to solve with this market-based approach access to regional sports programming controlled by cable incumbents. Regional sports is among the most popular programming to consumers, many of whom insist on the ability to see the games of their local teams. Given its very nature, this programming is unique and cannot be duplicated by new entrants who are denied access. Some incumbent providers have exerted their control over this must-have programming to handicap new entrants. In many cases, cable incumbents have sought to exploit the so-called terrestrial loophole in an effort to deny competitive providers access to this must-have programming. Cable incumbents know full well that a new entrant lacking regional sports or lacking the HD format of that programming will not provide a meaningful choice for consumers. There is a long record documenting that cable incumbents have used this loophole to handicap com competitive providers, including in San Diego, Philadelphia, and New York. Verizon has experienced this problem firsthand when Cablevision refused to provide access to its regional sports networks, MSG and MSG Plus, in the New York City and Buffalo areas. While we obtained access to the standard definition version of these channels only after filing suit at the FCC, Cablevision has steadfastly refused to even discuss 
providing Verizon access to MSG and MSG Plus and HD on any terms whatsoever. By its refusal, Cablevision is seizing on the growing import of HD technology to consumers, particularly in the context of sports programming. A recent consumer survey conducted for Verizon found that nearly 60% of New York City subscribers say they are not likely at all to consider switching to a provider that does not provide their regional sports in HD. We have urged the FCC to take action because denial of access to this programming denies any meaningful choice to the many consumers for whom local sports are critical. In order to eliminate any disputes, however, Congress should adopt a targeted legislative fix to ensure access to the unique regional sports programming that consumers demand. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Denson. Mr. Thayer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and I appreciate you inviting me here today to speak about this important issue. My name is Adam Thayer, and I'm the president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, a digital economy think tank here in Washington, D.C. I've written extensively on this important subject, including two books on the topic. And in my work, I've argued that regardless of underlying business structures or ownership patterns, the critical question that must govern this debate about the state of the media marketplace is, do citizens have more news, information, and entertainment choices at their disposal today than in the past? And I am pleased to report that all of the evidence suggests that the answer to that question is unambiguously yes. Indeed, we now live in a world of unprecedented media abundance where consumers can increasingly obtain whatever they want, wherever they want, however they want to. Citizens of all backgrounds and belief are benefiting from this modern media cornucopia. And nowhere has this abundance been more evident than in the field of video programming. Although the provision of video services entails significant upfront investment at every step of the value chain, we have more video options and diversity at our disposal today than ever before, and at generally falling prices. In sum, there's more competition for our eyes than ever before. Consider traditional broadcasting, which was once synonymous with television itself. Most of us can remember when just three or four VHF channels and a few fuzzy UHF, cha uh, UHF channels were all we had at our disposal. Today we have seven nationwide broadcast networks, and the number of local broadcast stations has doubled since 1970. Competition against and among traditional broadcasters is intense, and the viewing audience has become remarkably fragmented. The collective audience share for broadcast networks has fallen every year for the past decade. Competition is also intensifying among cable, telecom, and satellite-based platforms. Better yet, the number of channels available on these platforms has skyrocketed from just 70 in 1990 to 565 in 2006, the last year for which we have FCC data. The resulting diversity on the dial has been truly breathtaking, and almost every human interest is now covered by some sort of video network. And some of the most impressive gains have been made by minority-oriented, foreign language, religious, and children's-based programming. Importantly, the largest share of the growth in the multi-channel video marketplace has actually come from independent programmers and owners. The percentage of pay TV channels owned by cable distributors has plummeted from 50% in 1990 to under 15% today, and that percentage is now significantly lower following the split between Time Warner Cable and Time Warner Entertainment. In fact, that percentage of vertical integrations is probably in the single digits now. Thus, while the Cable Act of 1992 was motivated by fears of excessive vertical integration and gatekeeper power in the delivery of video programming, today's marketplace is actually intensely competitive and rich in its diversity. Meanwhile, new video empowerment technologies such as DVRs, VOD, Blu-ray, and so on have revolutionized the way that the public consumes visual media and given viewers unprecedented control over their preferences and timetables. While traditional platforms like cable and satellite offer a sea of diverse programming, the Internet's digital distribution platforms offer oceans of new content. Even defining a media outlet today has become very difficult as new technologies empower average citizens to become producers of news and entertainment themselves. Thanks to personal computers, websites, blogs, camcorders, cam digital cameras, cell phones, and so on, anybody can be a one-person newspaper or broadcaster. Some might call it amateur media creation, but it is media creation, and it certainly is competing for eyeballs. The Internet has also empowered a growing number of consumers to cut the video cord altogether by canceling their monthly video, multi-channel video subscriptions and getting their video from a combination of other sources. If the committee wants a glimpse into the future, I suggest you invite a few teenagers or 20-somethings to testify about how they consume video today. They probably couldn't name most broadcast networks or multi-channel video providers, but they would regale you with stories about how they've seen or shared video 
on platforms ranging from YouTube to iTunes, Vimeo, Views, Juice, Foxy, Vho, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon On Demand, Sony's PlayStation Store, Microsoft's Xbox 360 Marketplace, and so on. While some here in town often wring our hands about the supposed gatekeeper power of old media providers and platforms, our kids are increasingly ignoring those platforms and moving on. This begs the question, instead of fretting that some traditional media providers have too much power, perhaps it's time to ask if some of them actually have too little, a concern we have today in the newspaper business, for example. Indeed, the very viability of traditional media operators is increasingly in doubt as they lack the pricing power and the ability to control when, where, and how their content is delivered and consumed. Meanwhile, advertising, the traditional lifeblood of the media sector, is increasingly spread across multiple platforms and being subjected to new scrutiny and potential regulation here in town. And copyright infringement has also made monetization far more challenging and placed serious strains on many content operators. In sum, traditional media operators could be in serious trouble, and now certainly isn't the time to be considering new rules and red tape that could hamstring their ability to respond to new competitive pressures. Regardless, America's video marketplace should be viewed as a pro-consumer success story with an abundance of choices, competition, and diverse viewing options. The only real scarcity that is remaining today is our personal time and attention spans, not video marketplace options. That's something we're celebrating. Thank you again for inviting me today. Thank you very much, Mr. Thayer, and thanks to each of our witnesses for joining us this morning for some very informed commentary on the subject matter before us. Uh, I'll recognize myself for the first round of questions. Uh, I'm not entering this conversation with any uh, preconceived ideas about whether or not we should legislate anything, and I'd like to make that clear at the outset. Um, I did support in, in 1992 the program access provisions as a part of the legislation that we passed in that year. I did so because uh, cable at that time was a monopoly and um, we wanted to encourage competition. The direct broadcast satellite industry had not really launched and those companies were not established. They were clearly not in a position to generate their own content with their own expenditures at that early stage. And the only way they could be successful in providing competition was to have access to the programs generated by cable. So we provided that access. And, and I think that law has been successful for the reasons I mentioned in my opening statement. Now that marketplace is competitive. The two satellite providers have subscribers um, typically equal to the very large cable systems. And now we welcome into the market uh, the very large telephone companies, in fact, telcos across the country that are beginning to offer multi-channel video, further expanding the competitive choice. And uh, Mr. Denson, I, I, I want to uh, ask you some questions about your arrival in the market, what that means for competition, and uh, whether we ought to consider making any changes in the law in order to sustain it or perhaps further encourage it. Some would say that a company that is well-financed like Verizon either individually or in partnership with other large uh, telecommunications companies uh, could finance the creation of your own content. And that's a situation very unlike the situation the direct broadcast satellite industry was in in 1992. Um, and so how do you respond to the idea that you could generate your own content given the fact that you're a very large, well-established company and could even partner with others in joint ventures in order to do that. I know you're particularly concerned about regional sports, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, but as a general matter, let me just ask you about whether or not you're in a position to generate much of your own content. Certainly. <clears throat> You know, we actually have financed the creation of our own programming. We created uh, local, uh, three local, hyper-local news channels, uh, Fios 1 Long Island, Fios 1 New Jersey, and Fios 1 here in the D.C. metropolitan area. Uh, what, what we found is that local, 
hyper-local content was crucial in order to win over customers. Customers, it wasn't, no, it wasn't enough just to have content that addressed their entire region. Customers really wanted to know what, what they smelled when they looked out the door. If they were smelling smoke, they wanted, a, they wanted a channel that actually would tell them where that fire was in their neighborhood, and we do that. We also offer compelling co stories uh, within the community so that everyone sees themselves in the community in a positive way. So we, were, we invested heavily in that, and to be honest, Honest with you, given our number of customers, our, the, the the true benefit for the customer is the customer itself. We're not seeing that financial return, but we're doing it to benefit the customer. How, How important is the 1992 program access provision to you as a general matter? Well, I, I think. In terms of how important that that was for us in the creation of that content. I think well, not in the creation of the content, but getting access to other people's content, oh, cable uh, affiliated abso content. Oh, absolutely vital. That was vital abso to you. Abso absolutely vital at, at the time. You could not have launched FiOS without that. We would not have launched FiOS without without having the assurances that were provided in that in in, in the act. All right, let me come to the regional sports question because that's something you focused on in your commentary. As I understand the situation as it pertains in Philadelphia and to some extent in San Diego and maybe other markets around the country, uh, one cable provider has under contract the major sports leagues. I think that's true almost entirely in Philadelphia. And the FCC found in a study that as a consequence of that, the uh, number of DBS subscribers is about 40 percent less in Philadelphia than one would expect under different circumstances. And in San Diego, the Padres are under contract to one cable company, and as a result of that, the FCC found the DBS subscribership was about 30 percent, 33 percent less than otherwise it would have been. Um, some would say that this is merely the functioning of the private market, that these contracts expire periodically, and I assume they do. Maybe you know how often they expire and can tell us. But upon that expiration, why could other competitors within the multi-channel distribution space not go into the market, bid for those contracts, and if they offer more money, prevail and become the offerors of those programs? Uh, now, assuming all of that is true, why should we be concerned about this? Why not just let the market operate? Well, uh, for certain regions... First of all, can you tell us when those contracts expire? The, uh, every market is different. Every team is different. They typically they typically expire on a five year basis. However, there are some contracts specifically between uh, the Yes Network and the New York Yankees, which I know run significantly longer than that. Uh, in terms of the competition. Uh, for sure, regional sports networks are unique, and we cannot duplicate that. And the cost of sports rights are enormous, and there is no way in which we could monetize it. So to that end, we would not be able to actually make a meaningful bid for those regional sports networks. I think what we have here... So, so is it the concern that contracts are exclusive um, that troubles you the most, or is it the length of the contract that troubles you the most? It is well. It's it's two things really. It's one. It's the partnership with the with the joint ownership of a cable operator and a team and the actual regional sports network. There, that is that's definitely vital. But for certain, well, well let, let, uh, I'm I'm taking more time than I should here. But uh, we really need to understand how this works. I I I don't understand why it's a problem if the contract expires within a sufficiently short period of time. And that contract is then available for you and direct broadcast satellite and other cable companies to go in and bid on. Why is that a problem? Well, let me take, I'll address the, the issue head on. Uh, it's a problem because I don't see how we could reasonably expect a company like Cablevision, who owns the New York Rangers and won't even offer us, won't even negotiate with us with respect to the deli delivery of high definition content to entertain a bid where we would actually secure the rights for the telecast distribution of the New York Rangers in their market. So, so you're saying Cablevision has some kind of permanent right associated with the sports leagues 
um, under the terms of which it can deny high definition carriage or, in fact, any carriage at all to a competitor? Absolutely. They own the so there's they own a the permanent, permanent they, right. They own so, the so the actual contract doesn't expire. They actually own the league. Is that what you're saying? They own the team. They own the New York Rangers. They own the New York Knicks. And they are free to contract with whomever they like, and they contract with themselves, and then they deny the HD content to us. Now, on the other hand, a tale of two cities, we look at Philadelphia and Comcast. Through creative negotiations, we've actually been able to secure the rights, even though that, even though that content is protected by the terrestrial loophole. We've been able to secure those rights with Cablevision, the largest provider. Right, in, and we're, it, it's a similar situation. We are competing head-to-head -head in Philadelphia, and they could deny it, but cable, uh, Comcast took a different route. And we are willing to negotiate and bargain in good faith with Cablevision at any time. They've denied us the access. So that is specifically what we're looking for in this instance. All right. Let me just ask if anybody else on the panel wants to comment. And uh, the chair will tell other members I'll be generous with their time uh, for questions in view of the fact that I've consumed so much. Does anyone else want to comment on, on this? I'll Mr. Rutledge? A brief comment, yep. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just want to be clear that Cablevision uh, provides every game on our regional sports networks uh, to Verizon. Uh, what hasn't been provided to Verizon is a high definition feed, but all of their customers have access to every game on the regional sports channels we own. And in New York, there are four regional sports channels. Uh, the Yankees have their own, the Mets have their own, and, and uh, Cablevision owns uh, two channels, uh, one service. And. Um, it's interesting, uh, Dish TV, which we do uh, sell our service to, has the right to carry the high definition feed and does not uh, for their own competitive and business reasons. Um, they don't carry the Yankees. Uh, so they carry the Mets and they carry our services, but don't carry the Yankee network for whatever competitive reason they've decided. And uh, Cablevision has been without the Yankees for up to a year at a time in various uh, contractual arrangement problems and uh, succeeded in the marketplace. So there are a variety of approaches that different distributors make to the marketplace, and it's quite robust, and, it's, right. uh, and there's quite a few regional sports okay. there as well. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, recently I attended an uh, open mobile TV forum. And, and spoke to all the operators, and uh, it was sponsored, I think, by LG and uh, ION. And they had all these mobile devices uh, where I could get television on here. Um, so it appears to me that the next challenge is going to be when the TVs are sold to the consumers and they have an Internet chip in it, so I can decide do I want to get cable or do I want to get direct TV or do I want to go to the internet and get live streaming of digital or high definition programming? And that seems to me as a consumer that's where I would go. I would have the digital and high definition streaming on my mobile and I'd have it at home on my television. And there might be a point where I might not say I even need a cable or direct TV, a, a, a satellite TV because I'm just going to get it through the Internet. I think that after I went to this forum, it seemed to me the next really growing demand is going to be that everything is going to come through the broadband Internet. It will be high definition and it will be high speed. So, Mr. Rutledge, if I'm wrong, you can tell me, but it seems to me that's where you folks should be making your investment uh, for programming over the Internet in the future. And I guess my question is, is that true? And if it is true, what kind of deregulation or re regulation should be involved? And certainly you might want to comment on network, network neutrality or network regulation, as I call it, which would be, even as we speak today, I think the FCC is going to have a vote on it. So uh, I'd be curious about your opinion and then Mr. Uh, Denson and Mr. Moore. Ranking Member Stern, thank you. Uh, the uh, – the, uh, does the future that explained, does that, does that seem a, a, a likelihood? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very complicated uh, future. And what's happening is that uh, devices that you I need you to make your answer pretty short so I can yeah. move around here. Yeah. Devices, devi there's a device convergence so that what looks like a phone is a television and what looks like a television is a phone. 
Okay. And uh, we have products that work really well. Uh, and one of the things Cablevision has done is launched the first 100 megabit uh, data service across this entire footprint. We're the fastest data service in the country and the only company offering speeds at that level to all of its customers. And, uh, so you've our, already made investment in this? Yeah, we, we've been putting uh, investments in what's called Doxus 3.0, okay. which is the most advanced uh, platform out there in terms of high-speed capacity. We believe that if our customers can use that network and be happy with the way that network operates, that we'll be able to sell our network services. And, and as part of that, we encourage developers of programming to make applications that work on a big fat network like we sell. And uh, so our goal is to have content providers flourish and have people subscribe to us because we have the best network. Okay, uh, Mr. Denson. Yeah, and I think we're in a similar position. I think you're exactly right is how you see the, the future. And what you've really described is the TV, where, the TV Everywhere initiative, which is a collaborative initiative amongst all distributors in the multi-channel video marketplace. So in that situation, I think what you're looking at is programmers, content providers, are looking to drive their, drive their revenue from subscription-based services, as are we as distributors. So the answer, but your, your, your unique insight was, well, if I have a phone, I'd like to see it on the phone. If I have it on the PC, I'd like to see it on a PC and TV. You subscribe one place, and then you get, you get access to the content across every device. And what that does is that spurs the innovation on our side. As a distributor, we need to make sure that we have the fastest networks, and we do. We, may, we need to make sure that we have the best picture quality, not just across one platform, Fios, but broadband and also our Vcast video, uh, the Verizon uh, video, uh, wireless video service as well. So we are enabling those services and we're doing it across carrier. So we're not, so we're not looking to make it unique for Verizon itself. We want to work with the Time Warners, the Comcast, the cable visions of the world. So it doesn't matter where a customer is, that customer can actually access their content by paying just one time to one distributor. Okay, Mr. Moore, based upon sort of what I sort of prophesize what I think is going to happen here. Uh, why couldn't I get a website and I go to you and say, Mr. Moore, you know, I'm very impressed what you did with Star Trek and the next generation. I want you to do the next, next generation, and I'll pay you. You come on to my website, and we'll be through the Internet everywhere, and that gives you access. That seems simple to me, but based upon what I say is going to happen in the future, do you see problems of you and others with your talent, your skill, getting this programming to the consumer market? Well, I think, I think you're correct in that that is theoretically possible. I think that, however, the convergence that I think we all agree is coming is going to take a while, and that history shows is that these sorts of technologies don't completely wipe out prior technologies. When television came along, everyone said that the movies are going to die, and when the right. VCR came along, they all said that movies and television were going to die, and none of those things have proven true. And I think the point is that traditional media and the way that we've known television for a very long time is probably going to continue in some form for quite for the foreseeable future. An internet, uh, a, a web startup site like the one that you're postulating will have its biggest problem to get people to come see it. So it's all about getting the consumer access to so go find that. So I went to advertise and I said, Mr. Moore, who did this in Star Trek, is, is, has got something, you know, and I would create a sensation like they're trying to do with the uh, Dan Brown's new book, The Symbol, they're creating all this sensation to try and sell it. I'd have to do all that as part of the contract with you to get it you is, to do it. It is a viable uh, form that you're, that you're postulating. Uh, again, it takes a tremendous amount of money to create television programs like the ones that I've done. It then create, takes a tremendous amount of money to make them accessible to the audience. And but only the big players can do it then? Only the big players basically can do it, and if the big players have basically own the means of their own production, they tend to go to those. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mr. Knorr? Um, thank you. Thank you, Congressman Stearns. Uh, I think this is a, an excellent question that you're posing, and, and really our concern about the ESPN 360 business model goes directly to this. In your hypothetical, if Mr. Moore was able to put together a website and put on his content under the business model that we're concerned about, where all of our broadband subscribers are paying in this case ESPN, but it could be any of the existing uh, major brands could leverage uh, this type of arrangement that anyone, any one of my customers that access Mr. Moore's content 
um, not only would we be paying Mr. Moore, but we would be paying all these other existing content providers, in which case a competing entity never would be able to get ahead because every time someone went to this new entrant, the existing companies would make money. And there would be no way um, that someone could get a pure connection to the Internet and choose to take a different path. It would carry over the existing cable business model and in many cases the existing cable participants onto the Internet um, and replicate. Um, my time's expired unless there's someone else who wanted to answer the question, Mr. Payne. I'd just, just like to uh, briefly comment on the, the ESPN 360. I mean, ES, ES, ESPN.com is a, f a free Internet site that, is that everybody who has an Internet connect connection can access. It is a very, very competitive business, uh, whether and every month we look at Yahoo Sports, ESPN.com, Fox Sports, CBS Sportsline. But that is a – there's more video on ESPN.com itself than any of the other dot-com sites. ESPN 360 is a unique uh, per-sub uh, business model that, in fact, we created to help broadband adoption. And today there is – we have no evidence of someone raising their ISP fee to a consumer because they've launched ESPN 360. And it's – we don't force people. We're only – we're in 50 million homes. It's – doubled over the last year because of the popularity of the service. But the whole purpose of 360 was to help uh, broadband get further adoption in our country because it is, it is programming that drives, that will help drive adoption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Stearns. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Stupak, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Knorr, in your testimony, you state that the ACA members pay ten times as much as your competitors for the same content. How have you been able to make this uh, determination? And by competitors, do you mean like satellite providers like DISH and DirecTV? Um, competitors in some cases, uh, DirecTV and satellite. Um, in other cases, larger uh, cable operators. And, and a lot of it is anecdotal based on smaller cable operators that acquire um, cable systems from larger providers. Um, see the discrepancy in, in the cost of programming, um, and that is, you know, that, that is anecdotal. That's one of the things that we're putting out there is we'd like the FCC to empirically um, examine and review programming to determine what level of price discrimination occurs. I mean, based on acquisitions and other things, we know that it is occurring. Um, the, documenting that is what we want to do so that we can address the problem. Well, um like in my district there, i got a very rural district, Sunrise Communications paying about $40 for 35 channels, and that's a cable. But then yet, same area, Dish is offering for $30 over 100 channels. Is that what you're doing your – because that's about 300 percent increase if you look at the number of channels. And I think there's a lot of things that figure into that. One is the disparity in cost of programming. Uh, another one is, uh, again, the unique burdens of being a small operator. I mean, the regulatory costs – um, retransmission costs, disparities, and all those costs make it more difficult for a small opera to make investments. So you're taking all those in consideration when you say ten times more than? No, in, in, in programming alone, it can be up to that, okay. up to that much just in programming. And then those other things would explain the disparity you're talking about of having 35 channels for a higher price than 100 right. channels. Well, you also said you're given a take it or leave it offer when attempting take it or leave it when you're attempting to uh, negotiate a program carriage. Mm -hmm. um, Especially with, uh, in regards to retransmission consent. Okay. Expl how does that negotiation go? It's just take it or leave it? Or, or do you have any input? Do you have any room to it, negotiate? It, it, or is it just here's what we're offering, that's it? It varies. In many cases, um, it is getting a contract and saying, here's the deal if you want to carry the network. And, well, that deal doesn't work for us. Okay, here, here's the deal. You sign it, you don't sign it, it's up to you. Sure. As Mr. opposed to, oh, go ahead. Okay. Mr. Pine was shaking his head there. Do you want to add something on that one? Well, I <laughs> probably shouldn't have shaken my head. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask anyways, even if you didn't shake your head. Okay. Because you're one of the bigger ones, so I was going to ask. Well, as, as it, I mean, we, 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 um, we work very hard to um, work and help our smaller cable affiliates, as I mentioned in my testimony. I mean, two specific things. 
as it relates to retransmission consents for our own, for our own stations. Um, in this last round, we, we in fact, in, in an effort to help, um, I mean, we did, it was a take it or leave it offer, but it was free retransmission consent. In, in other words, the 1992 Cable Act allows us to make a cash offer available right. or negotiate some other consideration. We have practiced that successfully for since 1993, actually. But in this last round, in an effort to help our smaller operators, it, we, we said, okay, for these 90 in these smaller territories, we will not extract any cash or ask for any other consideration. You can have it for the next three-year cycle. And I think, honestly, Mr. Pye makes an excellent point. Um, ESPN generously offered free carriage to about 90 of our 1,000 cable systems. Um, but he also said exactly what the fact is. It was a take-it-or-leave-it offer. ESPN generously met, is made a zero-cost take-it-or-leave-it offer to those smaller cable operators. Many, many, many of the broadcasters in this country are not so generous, and that's the problem. Well, Mr. Bryan, let me ask you this. Are you planning to sell access to that ESPN 360 directly to consumers over the Internet if the service provider does not pay for access? That is not, um, that is not in our, that is not our business model uh, today, no. Okay. We, have other, we have other products at ESPN.com, and actually throughout the entire portfolio, such as ESPN Insider, which is something that if you subscribe, if, if you get ESPN.com, you can subscribe that goes into deeper that we offer directly to consumers. But ESPN 360, no. Okay. Well, if the content is so compelling, I, I would think you'd want to get it out there without having to go through the ISP, just sell it directly to consumers. Again, in this, this uh, fascinating space of uh, the Internet, um, we, we, we are looking for way, we are looking for multiple different models to, to get our content to consumers. And we have ESPN.com, which is for free. We have an ESPN mobile product. We have ESPN right. Insider. We have ESPN VOD. But in this particular case, we believe this business model actually helps the adoption. And we don't force it on anybody, but, which, is our, which is our decision. But we think it will actually help the adoption. And in fact, Beta does research, which is a sort of cable industry uh, uh, entity that sort of values the different programming. And you know, ESPN 360 has been named the number one uh, broadband service to help adoption of broadband. And that, that's our goal. That's why we would do it. Okay. But the service provider is still paying something, right? Someone's paying some, somewhere along the line here. Usually we go on the Internet, we think we can get have access and have it pretty much free. But, right. but we're, in a way, you're no longer, you're putting an extra hurdle out there for someone to. Well, I think, I think as uh, the, way, the way we look at it is it is the service provider's option right. to, work, to negotiate a deal or not. Um, from, you know, um, and we, again, there are many providers who don't. In fact, Cablevision doesn't carry 360, nor does Time Warner at the moment. Comcast and Cox Communications just signed up, and Verizon has it. So it's a competitive uh, product in the marketplace. And then I'll, I mean, I'll just say is our, the reason we developed the product was that as we saw Internet or broadband penetration grow, we saw that there would be a plateau at some point and that it would need extra content and ultimately, we, we are here trying to provide that content. And the, you know, the margins in the ISP world for providers are, you know, depending on who you look at, anywhere from 40 percent to 70 percent. So we're ultimately helping to support that model. Thank you very much, Mr. Stupak. The uh, gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we have a vote on the floor, so I know that we need to be. We, we do, but we've got eight minutes left uh, here, so I think minutes, we can well, probably I'll try to give some of that back. I've, I didn't hear the uh, opening statements of the panel, and I didn't hear all the statements of the um, of our witnesses. But I'm I'm trying to figure out why we're having this hearing. Uh, it looks like we've got a food fight going on between some of the folks that, at some point in the past, decided to buy a sports team and a venue and a medium to distribute that programming, and the people that didn't do that don't like it. Am I wrong? 
Uh, <clears throat> I'll take that. I, I, I think, uh, are, are you wrong? Uh, I wouldn't go so far to say that you're wrong, but what I would say is that there is certain baseline content that is unique in a community that without it, we cannot compete. And we'd like very much better to compete on the services that we do have and the innovation that we've created. We offer over 400 digital channels, over 17,000 video on demand channels, the highest broadband speeds, the biggest, the best picture quality, and we want to make that choice to the, cu to the customer. We offer more foreign languages than any other distributor, yet if we do not have the regional sports networks that are germane to that particular community, then it's not meaningful choice. Now, is there, is there any prohibition with you uh, buying your own team? There's, <laughs> there, there's no pro. There's generally. I think a lot of people would want you to buy the Redskins right now. I, think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, is is anybody on the panel say that there's less competition today than there was in 1992? Are there less programs available? Are there less mediums available? Is there is there less content available? Well, I I, I would say in response to that that to when you look at the dial, there's a tremendous amount of competition, there's a tremendous amount of choices, but my, uh, the point that I, I would like to make is that the people that provide that content are becoming a smaller and smaller number. And yeah, I, I, I did get to hear you, and I, but even there is, if I heard you correctly, there's still eight, didn't you say eight companies that are in the provider business? Or yes, the there's eight, and of those eight, two of them are reality-based do reality shows and they're based in the UK and only one is an actual independent and the others are are the multinational media but e even even there is there is there some bar that would prohibit entry into that arena if one was predisposed and felt they had the creative ability to do so well the marketplace is developed in such a way that if a network owns its own in-house production studio there's a tremendous incentive to buy from that right. studio and not from an independent producer so in, and because these shows cost so much to produce and get on the air if you're going to set yourself up as an independent studio and risk all this capital you should be able to compete fairly but unfortunately what happens is that networks turn to their corporate sibling for programming more and more and more and that's essentially why you've seen a decrease from 18 production studios who provided content in 1989 to only eight today and as I said only one of those is a true independent and the other two are reality providers from the UK. Okay. Well Mr. Chairman I know we're short of time I'm going to yield back to the last minute and a half but my advice to the to our witnesses is go have lunch together and work it out and uh, you know if this is really if the Yankees not being available in, on, on Verizon is a huge problem, then Verizon ought to be able to come up with an incentive package to, to, to encourage some of the Yankee games being on Verizon or the, the 76ers being on whatever in Philadelphia or whatever it is. I just don't think, Mr. Chairman, I mean, this is an entertaining hearing, but I don't think this is a worthy of congressional oversight unless the goal is just to get these guys to work it out amongst themselves of which you and mr markey are past masters at that so well thank I'll, you very I much will join uh, you in that effort if that's what the thank you, goal uh, of this is th thank you very much uh, mr barton uh there are a number of people who are quite interested in this subject matter and i i, I choose to think it is an appropriate hearing uh, but it's going to have to be recessed because we have three votes pending on the floor of the House and uh, we need to respond to those. We will be gone for probably 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And um, so stay tuned and uh, stay close. And uh, we will be in recess until the conclusion of the third vote.